The next major unit that we are going to be looking at in Physics 20 is Dynamics. Dynamics generally takes about two weeks to complete. In Dynamics, the four kind of big topics that we're going to be looking at is we're going to be looking at Newton's Laws of Motion, so the first, second, and third laws. We'll talk about the concept of inertia. We'll talk about vector addition again. So when we're talking about vector addition, we're dealing with 2D forces usually, although we can talk about vector addition in 1D. We'll come to that a little bit later. And then, of course, one of the other big things we're going to be talking about is friction in a bit more detail, and we're going to be looking at static and kinetic friction. So the general outcome for this unit is we want to explain the effects of balanced and unbalanced forces on an object's velocity. So let's get started on dynamics. Now, we're shifting gears from kinematics to dynamics. Now, when we did kinematics, kinematics was all about calculating things like displacement, initial velocity, final velocity, time, acceleration, all of those things. So for example, right now, you can see my pen on the screen. You know, I kind of give it a little bit of a push. The kinematics aspect would be talking about like how far did it move? How long did it take to move? What was its acceleration? What kinematics doesn't care about is the why aspect. They don't care about why the pen moved. As far as kinematics is concerned, that's irrelevant. Where we want to shift gears into is this branch of physics called dynamics. And what dynamics is going to tell us is why do objects move? And when we talk about why objects move, the critical thing that we have to examine here is we have to examine forces. Dynamics and forces go very much hand in hand. Now in Science 10, you would have learned about a force being a push or a pull. In Physics 20, that's no different. A push or a pull still works really well. Now the thing with a force, it can have varying magnitudes. You know, I could take the pen, I could kind of just push it a little bit, or you know, I could give it a lot more force, push it off the screen. And of course, force is also directional. So, you know, I could kind of push up on the pen. I could push it to the side. Because I can vary the magnitude and I can vary the direction, we would say force is a vector. The main thing forces can do, we can do two things. The main thing that we'll probably be looking at in dynamics is we're going to be looking how the speed changes. But we can also talk about how the direction of an object changes too. This will become a little bit more important when we talk about things like circular motion a little bit later in Physics 20. So we can kind of just see here, there's different things that a force can do. You know, you can distort objects, you can get them to start moving, you can stop them, you can speed them up, slow them down, change the direction of motion. Forces are for sure very versatile. So the symbol that we will be using for force in Physics 20, at least just in general, is going to be this uppercase F with the vector arrow. We will talk about specific kinds of forces that will require us to change our notation just a slight bit, but we'll get to that later. Now, the new concept that we're going to introduce with force, it's also going to require us to have a new unit. So the unit of force is the Newton, which is represented by an uppercase N. Un, probably not to your surprise, it is in, named in, it's in, sorry, excuse me, it's named in honor of Sir Isaac Newton. So probably one of our most famous physicists of all time. And if you know anything about Newton, you know that he pretty much contributed to every possible facet of science and mathematics. He was very multidisciplinary. So the Newton is not one of the fundamental units. The way we break down a Newton is we could say one Newton, it's equal to one kilogram multiplied by a meter divided by a second squared. That will be important to know. It crops up on exams all the time, like what's the definition of the Newton. If at the moment you're kind of saying, well, Mr. O'Donnell, how do you get that? Like, it seems like you just pulled that out of thin air. Rest assured, I will show you where that comes from later. So the way we define a Newton is we define it as the force required to move a one kilogram object with an acceleration of about a meters per second squared. I have some facts listed here about Newton. So he was born on Christmas Day in 1642 with the uh, old calendar and he studied eh, he studied at Trinity College Cambridge University 
Newton was actually a politician for a little bit. He served as a member of parliament. And there's a lot of great things you can read about Newton. I'm not going to use this time to talk about that. But he's a really fascinating individual. And I certainly recommend reading up on him. He, he led a very interesting life. Especially his time as Master of the Mint. I really recommend reading about that. There's some <laughs> You'll learn some kind of interesting things about Newton. Now with kinematics, we can do vector analysis. So we can do all the 2D vectors. We can break things into components. We can add them. We can find the resultant. In kinematics, a lot of our resultants had to deal with velocities and displacements. The result that we're going to be looking a lot in this unit is going to be this thing called the net force. We're going to speak to that later, and we're going to save the 2D stuff for a little bit uh, near the end of this unit. For now, we're going to focus more on the theory and the foundation. The 2D bit will come. Just to kind of wrap up this quick little bit, we want to talk about some common forces that you are going to see extensively in Physics 20. And for those of you that take Physics 30 at some point, these are also think forces that you will see. So there's kind of six of them we just want to kind of quickly run through, give them a little bit of special attention. Now, forces, they can be applied by people. You saw me apply the force on the pen earlier. You can use animals to do it. So like in the olden days, horses pulling plows, machines can do it, or you know, objects just colliding. Like if you run into your friend and knock them to the ground, you've applied a force. So if we have something that's applied by an external object, this is known as an applied force. We can write it as FAPP, or more commonly, because we try to write as little as possible, we're just going to write that as FA. And you deal with applied forces all the time. So for example, if you're in a car, the motor is going to apply a force to get the car moving forward. The car will also experience some other forces, like drag due to the air, friction between the tires and the road. But we'll talk about that in a moment. The normal force, this one's certainly brand new to Physics 20, and this is the one that causes a little bit of grief with students. But as you move through Physics 20, you will get a lot more comfort and familiarity with it. Now, this is going to be a force that's applied when you have an object that's in contact with another, and they share a common surface. What's important with the normal force is that it acts perpendicular to the common surface. This is where the name normal comes from, because normal is just another way of saying 90 degrees. And you might not know anything about the normal force. You may have just heard about this for the very first time, but it has been a part of you since the day you were born. If you're sitting on a chair reading this video right now, the normal force is supporting you. It's preventing you from kind of collapsing through the chair, the normal force is supporting the chair you're sitting in, preventing it collapsing through the ground. It's a really important force, but we don't talk a lot about it up until this point. The main thing is it's a contact force, so there has to be physical contact between the objects. The normal force is something we will explore a lot in this course. So for the moment, I haven't given it a lot of detail. We'll get a lot more of it a little bit later. And again, it's always perpendicular to the contact surface. That point will be made a bit more important later when we study inclined planes. Friction forces, you know very well about this, just living in the real world. When we have two surfaces trying to move relative to one another, this is going to create friction. So our force of friction, which we denote as FF, it's going to act parallel to the contact surface. And usually, it's going to oppose the direction of motion. So friction's not generally trying to help you out. It's usually trying to slow you down. So if you have a, du a direction of motion, or a little bit later when we talk about something called the direction of intended motion, that is, friction's going to go opposite to that. There are two types of friction. We talk about static friction when an object's not moving, and we also talk about kinetic friction when an object is moving. We will talk a little bit more about that later. Weight's also a special one. Weight is something we're going to kind of address right now. It's something that we will expand in a lot more detail in the next unit when we talk about Newton's law of universal gravitation. But when we're talking about the weight of an object, what we're actually talking about is we're talking about the force of gravity acting on an object, which we're going to denote by Fg. If we want to be really technical, when we talk about weight, we're talking about the force of gravity exerted between some mass and the Earth itself. So there is a slight difference, but weight is a force. And it's one of those things that we like to mix up in day-to-day -day life. You know, when we talk about weight, we kind of talk about weight and mass interchangeably, but I'll have that discussion a little bit more later. So really, weight's just that measure of attractive force between you 
and our, and our planet Earth. Or you could think of it as a force of gravity. Spring force, this is something that I'm going to mark later. We're going to talk about that in a lot more depth towards the end of the course. So if you attach an object to a string, or sorry, a spring, that spring is going to stretch. Springs, as you're going to learn, they don't like being stretched. They don't like being compressed. What's going to happen is they want to return to what's called their equilibrium state. So this is the state they'd be in if there was nothing stretching it or compressing it, kind of like a resting state. So when we stretch or compress a spring, that spring is going to exert a force to try and get back to that equilibrium position. But as I said, we'll talk about that a little bit more later. It's not on the books right now. Now, because I mentioned the force of gravity, there is a way to calculate the force of gravity or the weight of an object. So we have this Fg equals Mg. This, I'm going to just say right now, it only works if we know G. So if we know the acceleration due to gravity at a location, this will be okay for us. On Earth, we know G is going to be 9.81 meters per second squared. A little bit later, we'll have to adjust this because if we go to another planet, G is not going to be 9.81. So in this equation, Fg is going to be my force of gravity. It's going to be in units of Newton since it is a force. M is going to be the mass in kilograms. Important that's in kilograms. And then G is going to be the acceleration due to gravity. Or if you want to get really technical, gravitational field strength. But we'll talk about that a little bit more. So as I mentioned, we tend to talk about weight and mass being the same thing. But as you can see, they're not. They're related by this factor of G, but they're not actually the same thing. And again, you'll notice in physics and in day-to-day -day life, there's certain words we kind of use in everyday speak that have their meanings, but in physics they have particular concrete meanings. Kind of same thing with accuracy and precision. All right, so we're just being asked to determine the weight of a 25 kilogram object. So we know our equation for weight or force of gravity is just mg. So we get the mass of 25 kilograms. We're going to multiply that by 9.81 meters per second squared. So we do that. We are going to get a weight of about 245 Newtons. We get 245.25, but sig digs, we were, are going to want to have three. So I should probably actually put that little zero there. Now, this is a force. Force always required directions. So we're going to need a direction on this thing. Now, a lot of forces, we have to think about direction. You know, we've got to kind of go think about where it's going based on the sign that we got relative to our positive convention. Here's the great thing about FG. For us, it's always going to act down, technically towards the center of an object, but that's too much. Down is going to work perfectly fine. But don't forget the direction on this thing. People, all, Students always forget that, and it's like an easy half a mark to lose, so don't forget that. Tension, this is something we're going to study quite a bit in this course, and tension has to generally deal with strings, ropes, all of that. So when you apply a force through a rope or a force through a string, what have you, what we're going to have is we're going to have this force of tension. So it can be denoted by FT or just a T on its own. I'll probably use FT. So it's going to describe that pulling, that pulling trans force, sorry, that pulling force that is transmitted through the string, the cable, rope, or whatever object you have. Now the main thing with tension, tension is strictly a pulling force and it's always directed away from the object. Tension is one of those things that you can't use to push something. And if you don't believe me, tie a rope around something, try to push on the rope, see how much you accomplish. So if you're ever bothering someone, they tell you to go push rope, what they're telling you to do is like, go do something pointless, like leave them alone. Now at the high school level, we have a few assumptions when it comes to tension. We're gonna assume that the mass of the rope's negligible, it has negligible thickness, and that we're going to say that, well, I don't know why it says top here, or we're going to say the rope is taut and does not stretch. Why these are the inferences we get from those assumptions. Do you need to know the details of that at the high school level? Not at all. 
And then we've just summarized our forces here, the six main forces that we have looked at. And just to kind of finish this off, all of our forces can be categorized into four categories. We would call these the four fundamental forces of the universe. So we can order them from gravity to electromagnetism to weak nuclear to strong nuclear. In physics 20, all we're going to talk about is gravity. We'll talk about some other forces, but the only fundamental force that we're going to be looking at in this course is the force due to gravity. Electromagnetism, weak nuclear, and strong nuclear. That is reserved for Physics 30. So if you want to learn more about those, stay tuned.